the, the answer to that is it's been proven in some cases that they were not making the right interventions. A lot of the present programs, as I just said, are actually untested. I mean, the SOTP and the extended program were uh, taken out of use after after they'd already known for five years, actually, that, that uh, these programs were counterproductive. They went on with those programs for five years. Um, and thousands of prisoners went through those programs in that time. That does suggest that effectiveness was not the criterion being used. Um, the other uh, thing that I would say is that th those programs have now been superseded by other programs, Horizon and Kaizen and all this sort of thing. And they are just as unproven as the SOTP was. Now, we, we don't know they're doing harm, like we now do know about the SOTP, um, but they could easily be doing so, and we wouldn't know. And Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today you're going to hear from a guest with quite a colourful career. Robert Ford worked as a prison psychologist between 1971 and 1978 before moving to the Home Office Research Unit. Since then, he's worked as a house husband, a truancy officer and a journalist. He's also run his own B&B &B and published several novels. The latest of these is The Psychopath's Checklist, which is inspired by rather than based on any of the characters he's met. He returned to psychology in 1998 when he completed an MSc in health psychology and returned to a career as an applied psychologist, working mainly as an expert witness. In 2018, he published his book, Bad Psychology. Although this book focuses mainly on the fields of prison psychology, some of the criticisms within can be applied to other branches of psychology. He also sings with a sea shanty group called Dorset Rex, and I love to meet people who brought learning together from different areas, so really delighted to welcome you along today, Robert. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Very good to meet you. Thanks for coming along today. Hi, David. So you've spent many years practicing as a forensic uh, psychologist. So why did you end up writing a book critiquing the use of forensic psychology in the prison service? Well, essentially, I've been doing a lot of work in parole hearings. And um, it was quite clear to me that a lot of the risk assessment procedures that were being used uh, which could seriously influence whether people got parole or not, uh, were flawed, quite seriously flawed, uh, and were being applied altogether too literally. Um, uh, if I can give an example of what I mean by that, there was a very literal translation from high scores on the PCLR, which is supposed to um, indicate psychopathic traits in a person, uh, directly from that to risk. If he has a high score, he must be highly risky. Well, actually, it's not as simple as that. Um, there is, for example, research showing that uh, people who are diagnosed as psychopaths with the PCLR actually reduce their risk of violence very considerably over the lifespan to a point in the mid 40s where it, um, it actually crosses over uh, and become, that, that they become less risky than those who are not diagnosed as psychopaths. Um, and that seemed to me to be being uh, completely ignored. And when you see it applied, as I have done, to um, a man who is 80 years old and rather arthritic, um, you realise that actually psychopathy or psychopathic traits may be only one of a number of possible con con contributors to risk. And that wasn't sufficiently recognised. Another thing that concerned me very much was that, especially with sex offenders, there was a very heavy reliance on uh, people having done uh, courses, uh, the SOTP and so on at that time. And I'd had a look at the evidence behind those courses, uh, really starting in about 2003, um, and it was quite apparent to me that the evidence in favour of them was actually very weak. And not only that, I was very concerned that there was some evidence 
uh, at least some suggestion in the evidence that they might actually make people more risky and not less. Uh, in which case, not only were we making exactly the wrong recommendations uh, to the parole board, uh, but we were also in encouraging risk in quite serious offenders uh, when we were supposed to be trying to reduce it. So um, uh, that really is what got me started on the idea of writing a book, and I mulled it over for quite a long time. But by the time I got that far, uh, I'd done an awful lot of parole hearings, and I'd, I'd done an awful lot of reading as well on the, um, the, 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 the research behind all of these things. So it wasn't a big step from there to writing a book. And I was doing a doctorate. I've always been a late starter. I was doing a doctorate in my 60s. Uh, I think I was uh, 66 when I actually completed it. And that had, uh, again, the, 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 the reading involved in that had greatly influenced the way I was thinking. I, I really felt there were issues that should be out in the open and discussed more um, open-mindedly than they were being. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Robert, when I, when I started working at Grendon in 2000, the year 2000, there was a, I was going to say debate, but really it was an argument going on. And the atmosphere was absolutely poisonous between uh, psychologists and psychotherapists, stroke psychiatrists, particularly around this issue of uh, essay. And I found it, it was very difficult to have a kind of balanced discussion about the issue. So I think we're particularly interested in what emotions motivated you to write the book, because you know, I think an understanding of these can perhaps make it easier for others to hear the criticism. And I'm guessing there'll be some people who listen to this podcast who might find the conversation rather challenging. Well, what motivated me to write it? Um, there was this history, as I say, going back to about 2003, um, when uh, Rice and Harris published a paper um, on the outcomes or possible outcomes of um, uh, prison-based treatment programs. And they basically were saying that um, none of these had been shown to be effective. And one of the reasons for that was they'd never been properly researched. No, the programs had never actually been properly evaluated. The, the methodology was seriously flawed. I mean, in brief, what they were really saying was that people had accepted very weak evidence because it suited them to do so. Uh, it confirmed their prejudices. Well, as psychologists, we know all about <laughs> confirmation bias, except when... Uh, psychologists are, are, are acting in accordance with it, so it seemed to me. So I was very concerned that there wasn't enough challenging going on within the service. I was more concerned um, when I looked at some of the parole recommendations which were being made on the basis of very weak evidence. And, um, and then I got a bit angry. Um, and I got a bit angry because um, the methods that were used by some of my prison service colleagues to to deal with me uh, were quite offensive. Um, I've had three misconduct complaints made against me during my career. None of them was made by a member of the public. Every single one was made by uh, prison service colleagues who didn't like what I was saying. Um, and every single one was uh, uh, dismissed uh, at the very earliest point in the procedure where it could be. So I didn't feel I was doing anything wrong, but I was being treated as if somehow it was wrong of me to be uh, actually only applying strict scientific standards, which is all I was doing. I, I was only saying, actually, the research so far isn't good enough. We should be doing better research to evaluate these things and examine the possibility that they might these programs might not be effective, or even worse, that they might be counterproductive. But I was treated as a as a hostile, as it were, not treated as a colleague with arguments that ought to be listened to. And I knew that the prison service colleagues had uh, actually read these arguments because they were quoting them in their complaints. 
So they, they obviously knew what I was saying. They knew the research that I was quoting, but didn't seem to go off and read it. Um, and I don't know why that was. Um, partly, you can say, following some of the uh, uh, research on, on, on uh, bias in decision making by people like Daniel Kahneman and so on. Partly, you may say, well, it, it's a kind of emotional problem they have in dealing with the criticisms. Uh, if, if they're too bound up, if their identity is too bound up in their uh, de delivery of these courses and so on, then they're going to feel that they are under attack if, if the courses are criticized. But this is not a scientific attitude. This is an attitude that is to do with um, the organization in which they work. And it became apparent to me after I'd given one or two public talks and been approached by members or former members of the prison service, it became apparent to me that some of them had actually been threatened, um, uh, pretty bluntly threatened with dismissal if they carried on uh, questioning these things themselves. Uh, and we're talking very junior people here, I mean, trainees who, who were at a very junior level and being told you're not going to get your, your, your training finished uh, if you carry on like this. You mustn't criticize these things. You must just get on and do them. So uh, they were only obeying orders, really. Um, uh, and I think that defence was kind of outlawed in about 1945 or six. Uh, so um, I, I felt that people were being beaten into submission, basically. <laughs> um, and I was not going to be. And I'm afraid, had my prison colleagues said, you've made some points, let's come and discuss them over a, a, a table and, and actually see where, where we can reach some agreement. I think my response would have been very different, but they they simply didn't want to do that. And on one occasion, um, I was invited to do that. And on the morning when the discussion was due to take place, um, uh, I, I was told it was cancelled using a fairly feeble excuse. And I just thought, these people do not want to hear. And if they don't want to hear, I'm sorry, they're going to have to be made to hear. And then, of course, after that, uh, we had the famous impact statement on the effect of the SOTP. And it became apparent gradually, uh, a, a colleague and myself made a lot of freedom of information requests, and it became apparent from that that um, the difficulties with the SOTP had been known about and had been kept secret in effect. Um, indeed, when the results were presented to Liz Truss, who was then briefly the um, Minister for Justice, Secretary of State for Justice, uh, she actually suppressed the results because there was a, um, uh, a general election coming up and she, she uh, it didn't stop them being published, but she delayed publication until after the general election, which was a bit sneaky really. <laughs> but I could be biased, I'm not a fan. <clears throat> So um, as to why I wrote it then, I mean, I'd safely retired by that point. So I wasn't concerned about people making misconduct complaints or anything anymore. And more evidence was coming up all the time. So there was more to include in the book. I mean, I'd finished um, my doctorate, which was one of the things that uh, contributed to the book in um, 2016. I'd retired in 28, uh, sorry, no, 2014. I retired in 2016 and I was writing the book during 2017. And all of this time there was more evidence coming up. So uh, there actually was more to fuel the book. Um, and I thought it would just sum up a lot of the things I wanted to say. But yes, I was probably pretty fed up with them, really. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that all sounds very anti-scientific uh, to, to, to me and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether this um, issue of following orders is kind of exacerbated by the training of uh, forensic psychology much of which of course takes place in-house yeah uh, I think um it, it's very probable that it, that it does. My discussions with colleagues in the prison service suggested to me that they had very little broad training in psychology. What a lot of their training seemed to consist of was 
learning the use of particular techniques. You know, they go and do a course on the PCLR, so they know all about psychopathy. Well, I'm sorry, but they don't. Um, or they go and do a, do a course in, in um, uh, how to run the SOTP, and this gives them uh, deep, serious knowledge about sex offending. But it doesn't, because they need a lot of experience as well. And we're dealing with a lot of these people who are very inexperienced. Um, and a lot of them don't stay very long. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's a constant turnover of, of, of people who are not, com in some cases, not even completing their uh, training b b before they leave. And I think that's very regrettable. So when people come to me and say, um, I want to train as a forensic psychologist, what would you recommend? And I, I tend to say, if you can possibly afford it, then I would recommend doing uh, one of the uh, postgraduate courses, which includes professional practice uh, in it. So you end up with a doctorate at the end. Um, you've done your your uh, uh, in, your, your sort of uh, uh, practical uh, training, but you're not um, limited to one particular way of looking at the world. I mean, I've, for example, um, spent a lot of uh, uh, time looking at the work of people like Daniel Kahneman and uh, Daniel Ariely, who's done a lot of work on self-deception as well as deception of others. And um, uh, he used to be a student of Kahneman's, and it does show. Uh, but um, it, to, to look at why it is that people take decisions the way they do. And um, when I try to discuss that with um, a lot of colleagues, um, I find they've never heard of Kahneman. Uh, Kahneman's the only psychologist who's ever won a Nobel Prize. We really ought to at least know about him. Uh, the work of Daniel Wegner, who's done a lot of uh, work on uh, what he calls um, uh, ironic suppression, which is the phenomenon whereby you try to change somebody's um, opinion about something or their attitude or their behavior in one direction. And paradoxically, they, they actually change it in the opposite direction. Um, and, he's, uh, and yet again, uh, I speak to colleagues, never heard of Daniel Wegner, who's he? But he, he worked on the, he's, he's dead now, but he, he worked on this for years. Why don't we know about it? And I, I think we don't know about it because the training is very narrow and it's, it's a, it's, it seems to be very oriented towards the particular tasks that these people are going to have to do. It's, it's not turning out sort of broadly educated uh, people with wide with, with wide reading and and a wide understanding of a broader understanding of their field, it seems to me. Such um such good points and a, an awful lot of what you're saying really resonates. I think in terms of coming into conflict, if you ask questions that are in inconvenient, but I think also you're referring to um, Daniel Kahneman, and of course um, there's all that work around parole board um, judges making decisions, isn't there, and and how they're how their decision making is influenced by the time of day, and yes. these are all the sorts of things, though, that that psychologists should be introducing and making sure that people are aware of when they're making these kind of like life changing decisions about people. I think we might not find uh, we got on very well telling judges that their decisions were affected by some of these things either, but there you are. <laughs> No, but it might be useful to be having these conversations when, you know, decisions are made at other levels, aren't they, within within the prison service? So kind of yeah. CAT boards and other kind of like um, decision making processes, which which might, you know, really affect somebody's life going forward, but could be influenced by the the fact the meeting is, is before lunch rather than after lunch. Uh, I think to um, every interview that we do, and all assessments are based on interviews, amongst other things, there may be tests conducted and so on, but an awful lot of it is really based on interviews of one kind or another, but every interview is a social situation. And that means the interaction is two way. And I think we sometimes forget that and are inclined to look upon clients or prisoners or patients as somebody who's out, out there or under the microscope, and we do things to them, but they don't do anything to us. Thanks very much indeed. Uh... Robert, I mean, what strikes me, of course, is that very many of the people I've worked with, the psychologists I've worked with, are very intelligent, very sensitive, wanting to do uh, a good thing, do good work, brilliant, sensitive people. 
Um, and it seems, you know, what you're describing seems particularly tragic you know, because of that setting. Mm, I agree. I agree entirely. I had a bad motivation, if you like, um, uh, except when they get very defensive and uh, uh, try to shoot yeah. the messenger. But basically, uh, they're all trying to do good things. Um, but we're supposed to be scientists or trying to be uh and, and i think if we don't operate in that way um we get into very deep water very quickly so robert thinking about your long career how has the application of psychology within the prison service changed over time has it gone in the direction you hoped i i like the very polite way you tell me i'm now very old um but um uh, which I probably am by some definitions. I'm 74 now. But, um, yeah, when I was a prison psychologist in the 70s, which a, a prison officer described to me once as being back in the dark ages of the prison service, um, I was very frustrated um, in that. Um, w we were in a service that didn't know what to do with us, really. Um, we didn't have a treatment role. Um, we had a bit of an assessment role, but it wasn't a proper assessment role in the sense of being an assessment for a particular purpose. There was an awful lot of uh, sort of rather blind assessment. Oh, go and have this chap do a lot of tests. Um, but psychologists day to day um, got involved in a bit of advice here and there if management would listen to it. Uh, a bit of sort of really almost welfare work with both prisoners and occasionally with staff, although they were usually very quiet about about uh, coming to seek any help um, because they'd be ridiculed by their colleagues if they weren't. They were quite circumspect about it. But um, what I really hoped for at that stage uh, was that a time would come when psychologists were able to have a much more positive role and were much more involved in the rehabilitation of prisoners. And when I returned uh, after quite a long gap, it was about 20 years or so, when I returned to um, forensic psychology, um, it appeared to me that that's what had happened and it looked very positive um, until I started to look at the scientific basis for a lot of the work and decided that it wasn't really very scientific at all. Um, uh, but it certainly was initially looked like what I'd hoped would happen, that we'd become, we'd have a, a proper role in the service and that we would uh, be contributing to such things as staff training uh, uh, and uh, to rehabilitation of prisoners in, in a fairly, hopefully, scientific manner and one which had been validated by research and that turned out not to be the case. Right. So it's quite disappointing, to be honest. <laughs> so obviously in the prison service, there are a number of different disciplines, quite apart from operational staff. There are education staff, probation, health staff. How does forensic psychology sit in among these? And does it does it help that they're usually directly employed by the prison service? Well, if you're asking me about the prison service, you have to remember that I'm actually an outsider. I haven't been a member of the prison service since 1978. Um, so I've spoken to colleagues. I've met with some of them, usually um, uh, with opposing views in parole hearings. So it doesn't give me that much of an insight into um, the how psychologists fit in with other people. What I think I've noticed is a tendency to be a bit isolationist. Um, if I speak to uh, people in education um, and in, in health, they often don't seem to have much to do with the psychologists. Um, now that could be wrong, it could be just the impression I've gained. But then again, the whole business of contracting things out uh, is very makes things very, very difficult. And to give you an example, um, uh, in one parole case that I dealt with, I'd recommended that uh, he should receive treatment 
for what was quite clearly PTSD, um, and which was contributing to his violent behavior because he was overreacting to very tiny provocations. But people with PTSD do this. And I dealt with a number of court cases as well of people with PTSD who, who'd only got involved in something illegal because they totally overreacted to, to uh, uh, say, a provocation from a neighbour or something like that. They'd only become violent because of that, and they wouldn't normally. Um, so uh, a couple of years later, um, I found out, because he was again up for parole, this chap, um, found out that he had received no treatment. And when I inquired as to why, um, they said, well... Uh, we contacted the health department about it and the health department said it wasn't in their contract. So um, because it wasn't in their contract to deliver mental health treatment for some reason, uh, they didn't. So nothing happened. But on the part of the prison psychologists, um, they were in this particular prison anyway, they didn't have the skills available to, to undertake uh, psychotherapy with him or anything like this. Um, and so they didn't quite know what to do about it. I mean, my inclination was to say, well, send, send him somewhere where he can get it. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, he, th there'd been no improvement, no movement in this case in two years, essentially. Um, and it seems to me that contracting out of things, outsourcing of things has, has rather fragmented uh, the uh, uh, the, the organization and i say that's only an impression I, I can't claim to speak with much personal knowledge of uh, the modern prison service because i don't i don't work in it and i haven't worked in it i think that's probably true at times but i also think that there is a freedom in work in working for the health service for instance so i i've i've worked in prisons for 20 years but always for uh, well most of that time for nhs trusts and um, i suppose what a massive difference that i notice is that if you're working in a hospital setting as a psychologist you're free to advocate for your patient mm. and the organization expects you to take that role to some degree you're not you're not um treated as a as a um, an enemy for voicing that but I think within the prison system I think it's quite hard to advocate for your patient because I think the the loyalty to the institution and being an agent of the state seems to be a bigger priority than advocating for the need of the patient at times. Yeah that very much uh, chimes with my own experience I must say. Uh Robert, we've touched a bit upon the risk assessment and the large part of your book is devoted to this area. So, and it seems that much of psychologists' ongoing training is to do with learning new ways of doing a risk assessment or revising the way that they do a risk assessment. Do you think psychologists are better, any better than other professionals at doing this? Uh <laughs> I think what we have failed to do very often is to recognize the limits of our own expertise. Um, I was actually criticized by an American colleague um, who read bad psychology and, and was very positive about it. Um, but he said, uh, the only criticism I would make, he said, is that I think you have ascribed to us too much expertise in risk assessment, too much accuracy. What I basically said was that no matter what we do, we can predict whether or not someone's going to reoffend violently with about 70% accuracy. Um, and that uh, this isn't that great because you can get 50% accuracy by tossing a coin. Uh, I have to say that when I said this in a parole hearing, I, I, I thought, a fairly new parole board member was going to have kittens. He said, you're scaring me now. I said, what do you expect? This is a statistical prediction. And violence is very largely situationally determined. We may know that somebody has a certain propensity for violence, but in certain situations, but we don't know whether he's going to get into those situations or not. Um, but anyway, uh, 
the reason that my American colleague was critical was that he thought 70% was too high. Um, and I, I think I probably did qualify it a bit and say, you know, downhill with the following wind, we can do 70%. But if you look at the attempts that have been to improve upon that, um, they are uh, pretty fruitless. I mean, it, it, people have tried to combine the most predictive items from different risk assessment scales together to try and make a sort of super risk assessment scale only composed of the best predictors, and you still get about 70%. Um, and I think part of that may well be that we're, uh, in doing those assessments, we're actually only getting the characteristics of, of the person. Um, but whether people offend and whether people offend violently is only partly to do with their characteristics. There are a lot of other factors, there are social factors, there are economic factors. Um, if you look at some of the work on economic inequality done by Wilkinson and Pickett, for example, um, they make a strong case that economic inequality in and of itself uh, is criminogenic. And that is a factor that affects everybody. It doesn't only affect people who've got a bit of a propensity for violence. Theirs is just a bit more than average. Um, but where the average lies can be bumped up a bit by background factors like social, economic, political factors. Um, we can't take those into an account in our assessment. And it, it, it's very difficult to see how you could. I mean, are you going to go to the parole board and say, well, this chap has a 70% risk of repeating violence, um, but um, it could change if, uh, if, if the next budget uh, doesn't deal with such and such a problem. I mean, you can't really do that, can you? So we're actually, I think, doing probably as reasonable a job as we can do on those personal factors. It's just that they are only half the story, maybe even less, less than half. Do you think part of the problem here is the parole board's um, difficulty in managing the anxiety of making these decisions. It's almost, you know, sometimes you sit in parole boards and it's almost like they want to be fed a black and white fact of this person will do this and that. And to some degree, I think that that also feeds into this idea of doing um, the accredited programmes. It's almost like they think doing an accredited programme will make the person accredited at the end of the programme, um, which, of course, is nonsense. But, uh, you know, a lot of this does seem to be about parole boards and their anxiety of making these awful decisions and what might happen if they make the wrong decision and somebody, heaven forbid, um, re-offends in a very violent way in the future. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's the case. I mean, I mentioned the, uh, the rather new uh, parole board member who said I, I was scaring him, but all... <sighs> All risk assessment of any kind of risk, not just violence risk, but risk of I don't know, bridges falling down or buildings catching fire or whatever, any kind of risk you're assessing is statistical. I've actually had a judge in charge of a parole panel say to me, I don't want to know the statistics. I want to know what the, this man's individual risk is. And I bit back the response, which would have been the truthful one, which, which would have been to say, Sorry, judge, but risk is statistical by its very nature. And if you don't know that, you shouldn't be where you are. Um, but you, there's no such thing as individual risk. It's all statistical. That's the, that's the meaning of the word risk. Uh, and when insurance companies, who are the experts in determining risk, uh, try to do that, um, they, they look at all the factors they can which are relevant to risk. They look, they have massive databases by comparison with the things that we use. Um, we, we developed some risk assessment scheme on the basis of a, a sample of uh, a few hundred people very often. Uh, and uh, insurance companies will use hundreds of thousands. Uh, and actuaries will fall about laughing when they see the sort of thing that we do. I mean, that's not entirely true. There are some where there have been quite large numbers used. Um, but uh, if you look at things like the static 99 and stuff, I mean, those, those, those things have been based on very large samples. But even then, when you start to break things down and you're looking at not just risk overall, but maybe risk in a specific age group, um, then you can find that the numbers are getting awfully small, um, particularly with older age groups, 
um, because there aren't an awful lot of offenders in those age groups. It, you know, crime tends to be a young person's thing, and particularly um, a, a young man's thing. Uh, and, um, and people sometimes ask me, is, is, is there a genetic factor in crime? And I say, yes, it's being male. Um, okay, it's not all crime, but it's about 90 odd percent of it, you know. Um, so uh, I think we're often looking for a sort of perfection in prediction that we can't have, um, or prediction and risk, uh, perfection in risk assessment. And, and sort of put it bluntly, I would say that the best you can have is a statistical prediction. If you want certainty, go to Mystic Meg down at the, 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 the fun fair ground, you know. She'll, she'll give you certainty. She'll tell you what's definitely going to happen. But I wouldn't give much for the validity of that. What, what are some of the problems with how assessment is applied within the criminal justice system outside of the parole board? Are, are there any other problems that we might also find when these are applied within health settings? I think uh, I, I think there is too much trust in what looks to be sort of um, sort of sciency looking stuff you know numbers numbers are great you want numbers for risk assessment uh, and i suppose ideally you do in a way if you want to have a measure of uh, uh, how a particular um, person compares with the, the the general run of the population you you are going to be looking for numbers but i think we make a lot of mistakes i think we make um mistakes i mean i've touched on some of this already but i, I think we make mistakes in um relying too much on what we've been taught is correct. I think we forget that risk assessments are based on a particular sample and may not apply so well to other samples, um, e.g. Uh, other ethnic groups than the one uh, the particular instrument was based on in the first place. There's um, a lot of uh, risk assessment work which has been done on men and then gets applied to women. Uh, I don't think we know that's valid. In fact, I'm fairly sure it probably isn't. But um, equally, um, if most of the, the population it was based on are um, youngish white males, um, that's going to reflect that. Uh, the accuracy of the, of the prediction is going to reflect that. Um, it won't be equally applicable to young black men, uh, for example, or women or black women. Uh, it may not, for various reasons, be um, uh, applicable to people who come from different sort of social groups or social classes. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we don't do, a lot of research that we don't do, and therefore we don't know. Um, and my American colleague, Joel Dvoskin, who uh, uh, used to be um, president of the uh, American Psychological Association's Forensic Division, uh, had, was very fond of saying, uh, when I don't know is the correct answer, all other answers are wrong. And I think sometimes we're just too reluctant to say we don't know. And it, it is difficult. I mean, there's a great demand on people not to say I don't know. We get it from uh, prison authorities. We get it from um, sometimes from the prisoners and the lawyers. Uh, uh, and we also get it from the parole board and from judges in, in courts, in court cases. They don't want to be told you don't know because nobody's ever researched it. They want to be given a definite answer. Yeah, such a, such a good point. And do parole boards know how to get the best out of psychology? Could psychologists make a more effective contribution to parole reviews, do you think? I don't know whether they could. Um, it depends really what you want from them. Uh, if, for example, uh, a proven treatment program is available, and I do stress proven because there are still an awful lot of unproven ones and indeed untested ones around, um, uh, then I, I think that might well be helpful to know that somebody's done something like that. But there are other things that people can look at. And I, I I think sometimes we concentrate too much on those particularly psychological things, treatment programs and so on. And we don't look at things like um, social connections, family support, education, which has been 
quite instrumental in the rehabilitation of some prisoners that I know, uh, or I have known, um, uh, uh, the influence of things like employment skills, uh, having a co decent accommodation to go to, all this sort of thing. All of these things matter. And I think psychologists tend not to look at them. They, they tend to think of that as a kind of probation officer's thing. Um, but actually, I don't think it is just. I think psychologists could usefully comment on that. And maybe parole boards could usefully ask them to do so. Yeah. Are prisons offering the right kinds of intervention if they want to make a meaningful difference? <laughs> well, on the basis of some of what I've already said, you, you, you know how I'm going to answer that. Um, I, I think... Uh, the, the answer to that is it's been proven in some cases that they were not making the right interventions. A lot of the present programs, as I just said, are actually untested. I mean, the SOTP and the extended program were uh, taken out of use after, after they'd already known for five years, actually, that, that uh, these programs were counterproductive. They went on with those programs for five years. Um, and thousands of prisoners went through those programs in that time that does suggest that effectiveness was not the criterion being used um the other uh thing that i would say is that th those programs have now been superseded by other programs horizon and kaizen and all this sort of thing and they are just as unproven as the sotp was and we we don't know they're doing harm, like we now do know about the SOTP, um, but they could easily be doing so, and we wouldn't know. And I don't know if we're going to know until somebody decides to evaluate them strictly in 20 years and we have the same fiasco all over again. I hope not. Um, my understanding, which is quite limited because they were really just coming in as I was retiring, but my understanding of these programmes is that they are based less on trying to get people to avoid undesirable behavior and, and more about that they are more about strengthening um, the prisoner's own particular uh, characteristics which may uh, assist him in avoiding crimes in future. Uh, and I, I would have thought that was probably a better way to go, but I'm not sure that what is essentially a verbal process can really do very much. Um, there is, I believe, a little evidence that therapeutic communities can have some impact. But the lesson of psychology, it seems to me, or certainly experimental psychology, seems to be that the verbal processes tend to produce verbal results. And uh, basically, talking to people or going through various verbal type processes in a classroom uh, is not much like the situation they're going to be in out on the street. Basically, all of these prisoners, or nearly all of them, because certainly any that we're going to be doing treatment programs with, uh, are expected to go back out at some point. Even lifers don't usually stay in prison for natural life. They get paroled at some point. Uh, and they're going to be released into a situation which is nothing like the prison situation at all, basically. Um, they're not going to be surrounded by other criminals, one hopes. Um, they're, they may be trying to get a, a job out in the community. Um, they, there may be all sorts of, of, of differences. They may have family. They may not, of course, in some cases. Um, but that there can be all kinds of things that affect their behavior and affect the situation they're in. I think it's noteworthy. Well, it may be noteworthy. But uh, when um, Schmucker and Lerzel did uh, a um, uh, review of um, sex offender programs in 2015, contrary to the earlier one they did in 2005, they, de they decided that prison-based uh, treatment programs were not effective. But they also looked at programs in the community being conducted, presumably under the uh, auspices of people like probation service and so, and so on. And um, they did find a reduction in offending in those cases. And I do wonder whether this is whether this reflects the fact that that the treatment agents who are dealing with people who are running programs out in the community are dealing 
with people who are actually living life in a realistic, ongoing basis, whereas people who are dealing with, with people in prison uh, are dealing with people who are, who are in a totally artificial situation. Uh, one thing we know from the psych studies of uh, learning is that if you want behavior to transfer from a training situation into a performance situation, that the, those two situations are, are best being as, as similar as possible. Um, and really and truly, uh, life in prison is not much like life outside. So it didn't altogether surprise me that uh, Schmucker and Lozon maybe got a slightly better result for community-based programs, because those are people who are out in the community. If they have an ongoing problem, it's a real-life problem, which they can bring to their treaters and say, look, I'm having difficulty in this area. And they can make suggestions and coach people as to what's a better way of handling things. Um, they're actually helping to build real life for those people. But people in prisons can't do that, really. I wonder whether some of this is about the ethics of imprisonment and, you know, it's, you know, because I was listening to you say, you know, there's no evidence for, or the limited evidence for some of these programmes, but I suppose then you're left with, well, is it ethical to lock somebody up um, without offering them something? So there might not yet be an evidence base for it, but should we be at least be offering them something to, in the hope of, of it making a difference? And I, I think ultimately some of that is about the discomfort of incarcerating people. And then, and and I think people not really expecting prison itself to work. So therefore having to do something to make the experience something that, has meaning and can make a difference. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, if you want to be more than simply locking people up, which is basically what used to happen, apart from the ones, well, apart from the ones that were hanged, of course. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> thinking about that, when I joined the prison service, I think the death penalty had only been abolished for about five years. Um, so. Yes, I think people do feel like that, but I think it's a feeling that needs to be looked at more broadly. If you were in a situation in the health service dealing with an illness of some kind, um, I think you would want to be quite certain that what you were doing had a very good chance of not killing the patient, um, or not making the patient more sick than they already were. Uh, and there's an analogous situation here. And in, if, if you're looking at the effect of drugs on patients, for example, um, there are exhaustive trials done um, to evaluate the effects of those drugs on people. Uh, and they, they won't get a license unless uh, they, they pass certain criteria. And even then, occasionally, as we know, things do slip through the net. But there is at least a procedure in place to, to try to prevent um, the peddling of drugs that make people worse. Psychologists appear to be able to get away with anything on the basis that, and not just psychologists, other professions too, on, on the basis that, well, at least they're not going to do any harm. But I think after the SOTP fiasco, we can't assume that. And actually, the SOTP was not the first example. There are examples going right back to the 50s of uh, uh, courses that were you know, training programs that were demonstrated to have an adverse effect on people's offending, uh, to exacerbate it, and also demonstrated that uh, those um, disimprovements, so to speak, um, uh, were still measurable 30 years later in some cases. I mean, Joan McCord did uh, work on the, the, the Somerville project, which was uh, with young offenders in, in the States, in Massachusetts, I think, and um, found that the differences uh, attributable to the program were actually still measurable 30 years later. And that is actually quite worrying. Um, even with our own impact statement on the SOTP, um, they published... Um, the impact statement, which showed that there was a, a deterioration um, in uh, after five years, that after a five-year follow-up, the um, uh, the treated men were doing 25% worse than the untreated men, basically. But what they did not publish was the 10-year follow-up. In the 10-year follow-up, the treated men 
we're doing 250% worse. And that is stunning. They knew that in 2012. But uh, they didn't follow it up. They didn't publish it. it was, they published sort of the least they could, as far as I can see. And the only reason that I know about the 10-year follow-up is that uh, my colleague and myself made a freedom of information request to get the original uh, re research that it was based on, the original research by Catherine Hopkins. Catherine Hopkins, whose research was met with such uh, institutional bullying that she eventually uh, resigned and, and sued the ministry for um, uh, uh, constructive dismissal. I mean, it, 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 you couldn't make that up. I mean, uh, what kind of organisation does that? Yeah, I think there's two big ethical uh, questions in there, I suppose. I mean, the most obvious one um, there at the end is that actually if you know so that something causes harm, then, then you surely have an ethical and moral responsibility to to do something about that. Um, but as you were talking earlier, I was thinking about therapeutic hope and how an analogous situation, for instance, in um, health settings has been the plight of people who would be labelled as personality disorders, people suffering from complex post-traumatic stress disorder who were denied access to treatments because the treatments weren't effective for them um, and yet ultimately people being um, a bit more creative in their thinking and, and making more efforts to understand the experience of people who've got histories of um, of chronic childhood abuse um, meant that treatment modalities have become available such as um, schema focused therapy, DBT, sensory motor psychotherapy for instance and that wouldn't have happened if we just stuck with the line that nothing works so there's something about how do you get the balance between being you know having some hope and trying something different but being honest that that's what you're doing is you're trying something different rather than selling it with a certainty um which is what seems to happen within the within the prison service i, I think, think is what you're saying i think i've obviously come across as being uh, uh, a bit too down on on my fellow psychologists there i'm not saying that you shouldn't be trying new things and i'm not saying that um uh there isn't scope for new kinds of treatment uh what i am saying is that if you try those i agree with you you should be honest that it is an experimental thing but it should be a properly experimental thing so that it gets properly evaluated um with the sotp it should have been tried on a small scale uh smaller at least um <clears throat> but it wasn't it was just rolled out on a national basis we're psychologists we know what we're doing this is going to help everybody no, mate, it doesn't, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, and again, if we're taking a scientific attitude to these things, then we should be strictly evaluating what we do. And then we know that something is therapeutic or anti-therapeutic, as it may be, before we've, done, before we've done too much harm. So, Robert, most psychologists in prisons are also, as it happens, white women. What implications do you think this has for risk assessment and treatment? I don't think anybody knows. One of the things that I used to hear a lot from prisoners was quite a disparaging uh, opinion that um, most of the people who dealt with them were not only white women, but also quite young, um, very often in their early 20s. I mean, obviously not all, but um, uh, there, was a, there, there was a fairly high turnover and so people would leave without going to have a career in the prison service. And so th there was a view amongst a lot of prisoners that people were just doing this to get their student loan paid off. I think they may have had uh, too optimistic a view of how big a student loan is. But anyway, because actually it takes years to pay the damn things off. But um, the, the, implica the, the implication of that is 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 that they the the, the treatment the people who were conducting treatment had no credibility in their eyes because they were they were just doing it to pay off their debts and then they want they, they would move on and so on uh i don't think that's an entirely justified criticism but you can see how people fall into that sort of cynicism but i think um we don't know enough about the um 
effect on, say, elderly male prisoners, elderly male black prisoners, um, uh, or women prisoners, or dealing with women. Um, a lot of uh, prisoners were also of the opinion that uh, some of the young women that they dealt with uh, were, were scared of them because of the offences that they'd committed. Um, and they didn't think that they should be scared of them, but they, uh, they felt that they were, uh, particularly, as I say, when, when, when victims were women. Um, and, and so that, that biased, um, how, how they assessed them, uh, and how, how they reported on them. And I have to say, I did see cases where that was a very plausible interpretation of the person's behavior. There were often cases I saw where young women assessors would be um, scrabbling around, it seemed to me, desperately seeking evidence of risk when there wasn't anything to justify it. Um, and and it, it certainly in one case, I really would have liked the opportunity to take that prison colleague aside and say, have you been the victim of uh, abuse? Because she was so desperate to find evidence of abuse uh, committed by this prisoner within his own family, which didn't exist as far as I could see. And his uh, uh, his ex-wife didn't uh, uh, complain of it. In fact, she and her children, um, his, well, his children too, uh, had submitted statements saying that this, this was a complete red herring and there was never any suggestion of that. Um, but she was determined to find it, uh, even going so far as to say things like, um, uh, they might have been intimidated. Well, how are you supposed to do this after 10 years in prison? I really don't know. Uh, and th she didn't have any evidence for that idea, mind you. Um, and also saying that uh, not all uh, um, abuse, uh, domestic, domestic abuse involves violence. Uh, it can involve things like controlling behavior. Well, all that is perfectly true. Uh, but nobody uh, alleged any of that either. And I, and I did at one stage say rather acidly, um, uh, it's true that um, not all domestic abuse involves violence, but it does involve abuse. And no evidence for this whatsoever has been presented by anyone. And it was absolutely true. And he got parole and he should have done. He was 80. I mean, you know, you, you, you get a bit old for violence at 80, to be honest. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I, I did really wonder what was driving her. And I didn't think it was con concern about real risks posed by, by this particular prisoner. So um, uh, uh, I don't think we know is the short answer. But I do, as with risk assessment schemes developed on white prisoners being applied to black prisoners and uh, on males being applied to females and on young men being applied to old men and so on, all of that, I, I think um, we don't know exactly what, what the implications are of having mainly white women dealing with mainly, um, probably mainly white prisoners actually, but, but, but there will be su uh, uh, significant ethnic minorities and so on. And, and I just don't know what the impact is on, on them. I think um, if you were to have a mainly female population having their treatment delivered by mainly men, I think there'd be a bit of an outcry at that personally. And, uh, you know, I know a male colleague who went on a training course um, to run a, uh, it was a, a, a healthy sexual functioning course. And he said he, he, he did feel there was something inherently wrong about two women, two white women, um, telling males about male sexuality and how male sexuality was and that mm. felt that it might, the training might be quite different if there'd been more males involved in, in developing the treatment. Uh, where it comes down to sexual behavior, um, I'm, uh, quite a fan of the idea of having a male and a female facilitator. Um, because Yes, I, 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 I agree with what you say, that, that uh, it, the best insight into male sexual behaviour may not come from, from women. But the, uh, equally, the best insight into um, 
how victims feel about the things that have been done to them may well come from women when those victims very often are women. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't, um, uh, I'm not decrying uh, the employment of, of women by any means, but uh, perhaps uh, in this particular case, perhaps employing some men as well wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, I, d- I really didn't think you were, Robert, uh, but it was more a plea for the fact that I think there is, there's a need for more male staff to yeah. be involved in, in developing services that, that deliver treatment to, to men. Well, I agree. So, Robert, it, it seems to me, listening to all the very interesting things that you had to say, that uh, anxiety and fear plays a large part in a lot of the dynamics we've been talking about do you think there is something about forensic work that increases defenses defensiveness and reduces a capacity to think i think no matter how you cut it a lot of the offenders that we deal with have committed some very nasty offenses and i know a lot of the offenders themselves would actually agree with that um and the knowledge of that and reading the um, case papers and so on, which usually contain quite detailed descriptions of, of unpleasant uh, offences and so on, I, I, I think has got to create an emotional reaction. And I do wonder whether we adequately deal with the impact of that upon uh, the professionals concerned. Um, I had a regular client, a lawyer. Um, of course, well, it depends how you, how you define the client, but he was the fellow who paid my bill. Um, the uh, a, a lawyer who ran a law firm specialising in uh, parole uh, cases. And um, one of the things that he did was to have a counsellor come into the office uh, one afternoon a week and everybody would have an appointment with him to discuss any issues that arose out of the work they were doing. I thought this was very enlightened of you. And I said, why do you do this? And he said, most of my legal assistants are very young. Um, a number of them are female and they're reading about very nasty offenses being committed against females. And he said, uh, I want everyone to go and see the counselor because if I just have one available, and they can volunteer to go and see and they're then singling themselves out and everybody knows but if everybody has to go he said okay if there's nothing to discuss that's fine but everybody goes everybody sees the counselor if there are any issues they can be worked through with the counselor and he said i don't know what they are because obviously it's confidential but he said i think it's uh, as a responsible employer i like to provide the, uh, that that service and I'm not sure that we do provide that service to to the, the, the staff who have to deal with these people professionally in, in prisons. Um, and I, I, in fact, I, I don't know enough about how it's how it's organised. Um, but I think it needs to be confidential. Uh, it's not enough to have a line manager who may be very good at dealing with issues that you raise and who may not. Um, and it won't be very comfortable if the issue that you want to raise is an issue you have with your line manager. So um, I think uh, it's it's not enough to assume that these people who are often very inexperienced um, are going to be capable of dealing with all of this without any uh, support. I think they do need support, and I think it should be it should be given to them. I think there's a duty of care to those people, and if there isn't, there should be. Broadening out from from this, Robert, into broadening out from um, prison psychology, just thinking about the uh, prominent role that psychology played during the pandemic. Does your book have any implications for the SPIB subgroup of SAGE, the behavioural scientists who offer advice to the government on managing emergencies? Is it ethical for psychologists to be nudging the general public? And can we trust psychologists to make good decisions about what society needs? It's not the job of psychologists to make decisions about what society needs. We have politicians for that. Um, and the politicians should be 
democratically controlled and in my opinion a lot better democratically controlled than they are at the moment but let's not go there there's a whole <laughs> uh, if you if, if you want me to get get too political about it uh, that's the way to go um i don't have a problem with psychologists nudging the general public i mean I, th th there is a not in itself i think the 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 question might be what are you nudging them to do and what you're, you're nudging them to do should be uh, the, the in accordance with the policy, which is democratically decided. But if you look at things like, uh, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on what the various uh, nudging techniques that have been used, but I do know of one, for example, which was uh, a, um, a very simple technique um, to help deal with unpaid fines. But a lot of people collect fines from the criminal courts and if they don't pay them they end up getting arrested and sent to prison which is undesirable for all the reasons that we know it is and a system was devised for sending uh, people a text message to remind them that they had fines to pay when another payment was due because it's often paid in installments as you know uh, and the result of that, I understand, was that, in fact, compliance with court orders to pay fines uh, improved greatly. Now, I don't see there's anything wrong with that, for example, because what's the alternative? Alternative: The alternative is the, 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 the person ends up getting arrested. And it, it's not um, it, it's not like you're sticking somebody in their living room to nag them. You're just saying, hope you haven't forgotten this. Uh, here is a legal obligation that you have. Um, and um, they, it's very easy for people who are in that sort of situation and anxious about it, and when the money is scarce, which it often is, um, to just not think about it and put it all to one side. But if you get a text message on your phone saying uh, <clears throat> uh, you've got another instalment to pay, um, I, it seems to me a thoroughly reasonable way of using modern technology to to ensure people comply with their legal obligations. It shouldn't get ethically um, iffy. Um, if it does, uh, then they, the professional's concern should be guided by a set of professional guidelines. And psychologists do have such. And I know that. I was a member of the committee that helped devise them, <laughs> um, the BPS committee. And um, so they, they, they should be able to, to refer to those. And if pushed they should be able to refer to the ethics committee the bps and say what's your opinion on this um and it it uh, i so i i think yes there are ethical there are ethical issues but i don't think they are intrinsic to the business of nudging people any more than they are to the business of um giving people therapy or whatever there are certainly ethical issues which all professionals have to face but i don't think there is anything special in in, in the field of nudging if um if nudging helps people to eat a bit more healthily or something. Um, again, it's down to the politicians in the end, isn't it? Uh, to decide the policies that are uh, in society's best interest. That's what they're there for. It's up to other people to implement them. Yeah, although you did make reference earlier to the idea that following orders was... Um... Yes, it wasn't, and that's, it wasn't that arises. Defense. That arises because uh, people are not following the, the ethical guidelines. They're still there, yeah. um, and it arises because there are uh, uh, sanctions for for not uh, complying with official policy. Um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a minefield, but that's what society is like. <laughs> it is indeed. So, if, uh, finally, Robert. How, you've had a long career in the forensic field. How have you looked after your own well-being and made sure you're outward-looking and reflective? Uh, I think there are two answers to that. The first answer is that initially I didn't. Um, one of the reasons that I left the prison service in 1978 was that two years earlier we'd had the most violent prison riot uh, at the prison that I was working at. Uh, the most violent prison riots since 1931. And um, uh, as that was 40 odd years, which seemed an awful lot longer to me then than it does now for some reason. But um, it became apparent to me that all of the prison staff, myself included, had been really very badly affected by what had happened. Um, and there was no provision 
really for dealing with it. The prison service initially came in and told uniform staff that if they wanted to transfer to another prison, there would be no problem. They'd be able to go. Um, and um, then reneged on it because too many people wanted to leave and go to another prison. Um, and I find myself uh, actually carrying out um, uh, fairly um, untrained uh, counselling with uh, members of staff who, who did need it. Uh, and um, and I, I think I did too. And I ended up having quite a depressive episode. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I left uh, to go to the Home Office Research Unit, which turned out, in my opinion, not to be a lot better. It was very political and I didn't like that much either. And I'm afraid the depression did not improve. And that's why I ultimately left without a job to go to, uh, which was quite significant. Um, uh, however, uh, later, um, when I came back to working in prison, well, working with prisoners anyway, um, I didn't find the stresses were so great. I mean, my late wife was a bit concerned about it. Um, and she, she said, you know, you've gotten a bit of a mess before. Um, uh, saint that woman <laughs> she, she put up with a lot uh but um uh she would say i did but uh, anyway um uh she said are you sure you can you can cope all uh, cope with all of this um and i said well i'm not going to be working in prisons i'm not going to be part of the actual establishment as it were um i'll be doing something quite different and i'll be trying to inject a bit of objective thinking a bit of scientific thinking into these processes and i said i'm quite prepared for the idea that it'll be frustrating um but uh that's fine being frustrated is one thing but but uh just feeling that the monolithic organization that i worked for back in the 70s did not want to learn anything from what had happened was terribly demoralizing and, and they really didn't. They did not want to be told. And funnily enough, I'd been sending information to the legal, the, the, the regional psychologist. Uh, it was a different organization then. Um, but he was, he, he was responsible for the northern region, which is where the prison was that I was based in. Uh, and uh, I'd been sending him information regularly, showing how a lot of things about the prison were deteriorating. This is statistical information. And uh, after the riot, I said, OK, so why didn't you believe me? He said, oh, the problem is, Robert, he said, uh, everybody in maximum security prisons thinks there's, always thinks there's going to be a riot tomorrow. And I said, that is not a good enough reply. I, said, I was sending you information showing quite clearly a trend in the deterioration of various things, increase in assaults on staff, increase in fights amongst prisoners, increase in complaints, all sorts of stuff like that. And there were very large increases too. And I said, you, uh, you just ignored it all. And it became apparent, I'm afraid, that that was going to carry on. And there was no suggestion that anything might actually be learned from this about how to avoid riots. And I just thought, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, and ultimately, as I say, ultimately left. Um, so uh, it'd be an exaggeration to say it took me 20 years to recover, but it certainly took a year or two, and uh, uh, it was quite rough. The impact on my own mental health was not good and um, uh, comparable with uh, some of the other things I've been through as well. Uh, so it was um, uh, the short answer for that is that I didn't take enough care, and I should have done probably. Uh, I'm not sure that I knew where to go for, for such support anyway, but uh, I could probably have done something. Later on, um, as I say, I was dipping into prisons and out again, going to parole hearings and going to do assessments on people, and it wasn't the same sort of situation. Thank you very much, Robert. Really enjoyed the conversation with you. It's very thought-provoking. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, Robert. It was a real pleasure meeting with you and having this conversation.